Back in 2007, Apple revealed the iPhone for the first time. And to everyone watching, it seemed that they had made a major design leap. Most mobile phones at the time consisted of a small screen with a plastic keyboard underneath. The screen acted as an output, showing the user everything they wanted to see, whilst the keyboard acted as an input, enabling the user to control the device. In his presentation, Steve Jobs noticed some flaws in this design. The buttons couldn't change. They were always there so you could press them by accident, and they took up valuable space on the phone. Apple's solution to these problems was quite simple. Build a phone that was all screen and no buttons. The screen acted as the output, but with no buttons to press, what was the input? How would the user control the device? Users of the computer were used to a mouse and keyboard, but it was impractical to carry this around for a smartphone. iPod users used a click wheel, but this didn't give the fine grained control that the iPhone required. Touchscreens at the time were still very primitive and required styluses to work properly. And so Apple invented multi-touch. Multi-touch allowed users to touch the screen with one or more fingers, making the iPhone extremely easy to use, but unlocking incredible computing functionality. If we fast forward 13 years, smartphones with multi-touch screens and no keyboards are more common than those without. Apple's years of research and development are thought to have defined how users will interact with technology for decades. In the case of the iPhone, the multi-touch screen acted as a bridge between technology and the humans using it. This bridge is referred to as the user interface. As a user interface designer, my job is to determine the most efficient way for users to interact with technology. This has allowed me to pay close attention to the psychology and science between humans and technology and how this relationship has evolved as technology has developed. Many of us are familiar with user interfaces and use them every day, sometimes without realizing. However, you might not appreciate that the way you interact with technology has changed dramatically in your lifetime. For computers, the first user interfaces were just pieces of card with holes punched in very precise positions. The position of the holes represented data or instructions, and the user could input that into the computer. The computer would read the punch card and convert it into digital information. Over the years, this has evolved into the keyboard and mouse that we're familiar with today. And as we know, this hasn't just happened with computers. The earliest telephones used rotary dials, whereas phones today use the multi-touch screens that we talked about earlier. Gaming consoles, started with buttons and joysticks, which evolved into gesture control with the Xbox Connect and Nintendo Wii. Home automation brought voice control in the form of Siri and Alexa. And Pokemon Go and Google Translate have brought augmented reality to life. User interfaces continue to evolve at a rapid pace in order to meet the needs and expectations of the user. And with COVID-19, this is truer than ever. For example, with everyone required to wear face coverings, it's no longer appropriate to expect face recognition technology to be the default mechanism for identity and authentication. And with more people than ever working from home, virtual reality could change how we attend meetings and interact with people online. Just how long is it going to be before attendees of TEDx events and conferences or just have to put on their VR goggles or contact lenses to be transported away. But what if we could take things further? Brain receptive technology already exists, albeit in very primitive forms, and can be used to bring users even closer to technology. In 2019, researchers at the University of California, San Francisco, were able to use deep learning to translate brain activity into synthetic speech recordings. This technology is continuing to develop, and one day you might be able to use your thoughts to control your devices. Just ask a question in your head and Google will give you the answer, or think about your dream holiday for Siri to book tickets, or let artificial intelligence figure out what you want to eat for dinner and have it delivered by Deliveroo before you even get home. There are no buttons to press, 
no passwords to remember, just thoughts. Human beings and technology are on a converging path, and one day we could see the two become indistinguishable from one another. That is, human beings with technology inside of them, and technology using human biology to function. At this point, where technology control humans as much as humans control technology, our interactions with technology could reach a new level. If the technology exists to read human thoughts, then it's only a matter of time before it's possible to change and manipulate them. This technology is called brain-computer interfaces. An Electric Brain by R. Douglas Fields is a recently published book which discusses the medical applications and benefits of this technology. But there are also potential commercial applications too. One idea, for example, could use artificial intelligence to understand a human being's feelings and then use technology to react to this. Animosity towards a particular person, such as an ex-partner, could be detected and then the technology could block that person from your thoughts so that you never have to think of them again. Using augmented reality contact levels, we could modify people's visions so that they never have to see them again. Blocking people would move away from social media to real life. Victims of rape, abuse or muggings would be able to have their memory rewritten and live in a virtual bubble that excludes people who have done them harm. Other ideas go beyond just removing things from our life and think about constructing the perfect world around us. Our world is just a manifestation of how we perceive it, and technology could potentially leverage this for the better. For example, one day, I can imagine that your environment could change depending on your personality. Blue walls for when you're sad, brighter lights for when you're happy, and virtual flowers for romance. And the pinnacle of this technology would be that it's personalised for every person. You could choose one colour scheme, whilst your family could choose another. There'd be no decoration costs and no need to think about what you want. Artificial intelligence would do all the work for you. All of this is driven by data. Knowing who to erase from your life or what to add can only be known by understanding you and understanding those similar to you. The key to the future of user interfaces isn't just reading our thoughts or painting pictures over our vision. The key is data. Designing one size fits all products would no longer be enough as customers demand interactions that are personal, unique and available immediately. To do this, artificial intelligence would have to ingest huge amounts of personal data to dynamically design websites and applications in real time. This process is called generative design, and it's already something that is starting to make its way into the mainstream today. For example, Google Chrome will automatically translate text on a website, depending on your language preferences. User interface designers like me will have to think more about designing emotions and experiences, which will then guide the artificial intelligence engines that design the interfaces themselves. To start with, this may seem positive. For example, those with disabilities such as dyslexia would receive a different version of a website to those without. But as artificial intelligence gets smarter, then advertisers will be able to leverage this technology to show in real time how their products will make your life easier, encouraging you to spend money and buy them. Even if laws prohibit advertisers from inducing you to make purchases without your awareness, this would not stop cyber criminals from manipulating your thoughts and actions. When technology is able to convince the brain that it's somewhere it's not, the opportunities for taking advantage of human vulnerabilities are enormous. For example, hackers could modify virtual experiences to mislead users into giving away personal information. This personal data could be as subtle as head or eye movement, which can be used to replicate a user's digital identity. These replicas could then be used to make false connections with other individuals and take advantage of them. Hackers could, 
hypothetically, sabotage important meetings and conferences and threaten to distribute private information in exchange for ransom. Or they could place misleading information or propaganda into virtual environments to further a cause that they believe in. Even worse, vulnerable persons could be taken advantage of. To put it mildly, those with malicious intentions could have the power to alter the very fabric of our reality and we wouldn't even know. This dystopian future that I've described sounds like science fiction, an episode of Black Mirror or Doctor Who, something that's so far in the future that surely regulation and human decency would get in the way before it ever materialised. But take a moment to think about the last time that you used the internet. Google, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Pinterest, Instagram, TikTok, whatever it might be. Many internet services today are already using artificial intelligence to adjust your user interface by prioritising the distribution of content that you are more likely to enjoy and remove content that you do not. Surveillance capitalism is the act of using personal data about users as a commodity that is bought and sold to make a profit. In order to drive up their advertising revenue, social networks and internet applications need to keep their users addicted to their services. And to do this, they'll personalise your user inter interface. Those with a tendency to enjoy cat videos will see fewer dogs. Political conservatives will only see content that supports their ideologies and someone who shares personality traits with extremists or terrorists will be shown content that reinforces these beliefs. A recent documentary called The Social Dilemma explored the potential impacts of this on society. It discussed communities becoming politically polarised, fake news spreading faster, and mental health issues affecting many teenagers. The technology to apply this to our perception of the world is still in early stages, but reading and manipulating your thoughts is something that has been happening for years already without you necessarily knowing. The primary function of a user interface is to allow a human to interact with technology. As technology has been able to understand humans better, then these user interfaces have developed and brought the two closer together. It's hard to believe that the punch cards and rotary dials of the early 20th century had the potential to evolve into the interfaces that we use today. As researchers continue to develop these interfaces, then we can only speculate about what the future holds. The link between technology and humans and the development of computer brain interfaces remains a primary interest for many researchers. Facebook, for example, has been funding further studies of brain receptive technologies since 2017 and hopes to implement it in its services within the next 10 years. We can't predict exactly what social media companies will do if this technology becomes commercially viable. But understanding the power that the future of user interfaces leverages is vital to maintaining a safe and secure relationship with technology.